We all know there are a ton of slicer settings, many of which that are nested and interdependent. It can be pretty chaotic to figure out which settings do what and what to tweak to actually change your output. In this video, I'm going to highlight some key settings that you may or may not be using depending on your printer and your experience. Some of the settings I'm going to cover have different names in different slicers. Common names in Cura, Bamboo Studio, and Prusa Slicer will be shown on the screen. Of course, there are only so many settings that I could fit into one video, so if I miss your favorite or if you have a specific go-to, please feel free to add that in the comments below. First up is Detect Thin Walls. By default, each object printed will have an inner and outer perimeter made up of the number of walls or shells that you select. But what happens if we have features that are actually smaller than two perimeters? Typically, the slicing algorithm will just end up ignoring these areas and just won't print anything here. However, if you enable Detect Thin Walls, the slicer will be able to just add a single perimeter that works as both the inside and outside wall. This also will allow the printer to generate lines that are thinner than the nozzle diameter. Enabling this setting is also especially great for getting small features like embossed text to print properly on the surface of a model. Next is wall printing order. This feature can actually have a large impact on the XY dimensional accuracy of your parts. By default, most print profiles print the outer wall of each layer last. This ensures good print quality and an even surface when the part is complete. However, if the outer wall is printed first, you'll have a better chance that the XY lines laid down will be dimensionally accurate. Then when the inner walls are printed, the material is pressed away from the outer wall. Thus, any excess material is pushed into the infill of the part. Bamboo Studio includes even more options with the ability to select walls or infill first. Sticking with the dimensional accuracy theme, XY size compensation or horizontal expansion is another way you can modify the size of your parts in the XY plane. This feature essentially acts as a growth or shrinkage compensation value because it physically changes the path the printer will take offset by the value entered. A positive value will make an object wider, whereas a negative value will make it narrower. Adding or subtracting material can be a good way to make small clearance adjustments for components that get assembled together especially if you didn't design the part yourself. A good starting point when adjusting this parameter is 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters, either positive or negative, depending on where you need the material to go. Of course, I can't mention horizontal expansion without mentioning its relative, horizontal hole expansion. Unlike horizontal expansion, this setting only changes features that are within the part and doesn't change the outer boundary. Outer dimensions and features not fully encapsulated will not be changed. Slicers are strict when it comes to this feature. Even if a contour has a small opening to the rest of the part, it will not be considered a hole. Adjusting this parameter is a great way to ensure proper tolerance since it moves material towards or away from the center of the hole. But it can also be useful if you intend to drill the hole to a precise size after printing or want to install a heat set insert. Usually 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters is a good starting adjustment. Z-Hop can be especially helpful when you have a lot of small models on a single build plate, or if you have a model that has a lot of features that require your printer to travel a lot. This setting just instructs the nozzle to be moved away in Z slightly just before an XY travel move, and then back down when it is in its new location. This reduces the risk of nozzle to part collisions when the printer is making travel moves, especially at very high speeds. It can also help you avoid drag marks across top layers when you're transitioning between different sections of a geometry. While making this video, I realized that Bamboo Studio gives you the ability to change the type of Z-Hop used. The options include normal, which moves the nozzle up just like in the traditional method, spiral, which makes the nozzle do a little spin on its way up, and slope, which gradually moves the nozzle up in Z during an XY move. The primary downside to Z-Hop is it can increase stringing since there is a bit more time for the nozzle to ooze between moves. This can be minimized by slightly lowering the Z-Hop distance or increasing the speed to fundamentally break the string at the beginning of the move. If this doesn't clean up the stringing on your model, you may have to look at retraction. Retraction settings determine how much and how fast filament is pulled out of the nozzle to prevent oozing when not directly extruding. You may want to increase retraction if you see stringing on your part and your Z-Hop has already been lowered. The goal is to pull enough material out of the nozzle so nothing is deposited as the printer moves to the next XY location. When adjusting this, start by changing the length by only a few hundred microns and the speed by only a few millimeters per second. 
Too much retraction can cause clogs, because a lot of strain will be built up by moving the filament too far or too fast. If retraction doesn't solve your stringing problem, then you may have to look at extrusion temperature. Okay, yes, extrusion temperature is definitely the most obvious setting on this list, but it's important to understand so you can troubleshoot many different aspects of your prints. You want the nozzle hot enough so the thermoplastic does what it's designed to do, flowing out at the specified rate, correct line width, and layer height. This will depend on the material and specific blend you're printing with, but in general, if you notice your extruder gears grinding, areas of under extrusion, or just missing material, you will need to bump up the temperature slightly. On the flip side, if you notice over extrusion or too much material flowing causing blobs and extra stringing, you may have to back the temperature off slightly. As a general rule of thumb, I typically start by adjusting temperature plus or minus 5 degrees, just depending on what I observe. Definitely play with this to get the exact temperature needed for your filament. Another obvious setting is speed, probably the most talked about parameter in 2023. Many manufacturers are scrambling to produce faster and faster printers to make the quickest little boat possible. But high speeds can have negative impacts. Don't get me wrong, I love the speed capability of my X1 Carbon, but there are instances where the hot end flow can't keep up with the gantry movement. This is especially visible when printing with silk filaments because they are a slightly more viscous material. A lower flow rate will ensure a shiny surface, but when the speed increases, so does that flow rate, making the surface more matte. The easiest way to combat this is to dial down the print speeds 50 millimeters per second, or until the surface becomes more even. Technically, you can also adjust this by changing the flow rate or max volumetric speed, but I found changing the speed is an easy way to influence parts of your model individually. If you want to dig further into this, Stefan over at CNC Kitchen made an excellent video going over this phenomenon and what you can do about it. That video will be linked below. Next up is infill types. The different infill patterns available can provide various properties and strength profiles. Whether you need strength or flexibility in either two dimensions or all three, or you want to just save time or material weight, there is definitely an infill option for you. If I'm trying to get a quick prototype out and I don't really care about strength, I'll typically use lightning or a small infill density like 5-10%. to 10 Otherwise, most of my other parts are around 20% and I use grid or once in a while gyroid if I'm feeling like it. Of course, infill can play a key role in making the design look unique. Eric actually made a whole video on how you can use slicer settings in unconventional ways, and infill was actually just one of the tools he showcased. I hope this list of settings inspires you to experiment and try something new. If you like this video or got something out of it, please give us a thumbs up and consider subscribing. Of course, I couldn't cover everything in a slicer, so if you have specific settings that you use very often and would be helpful to share with the community, please add that in the comments below. And while you're down there, if you have anything specific you'd like to see Eric Nils or I cover here at the 3D Printing Zone, add that too. Until next time, happy slicing and happy 3D printing! Thanks so much for watching today. I'm Nils. I'm Eric. And I'm Wyatt. And this is the 3D Printing Zone.